The Sergeant at Arms will admit the members of the Senate and staff. Welcome. The Sergeant at Arms of the House will escort the President of the Senate to the rostrum. Sergeant of Arms of the Senate will seat the members, the Senate members. Seventy seventh Legislative Assembly of Oregon meeting in joint session welcomes you to the State of the State Address of Oregon's thirty seventh Governor, the Honorable John Albert Kitzhopper, MD. The Secretary of the Senate will call the roll of the Senate. Bear Sugar, Here. Bates, Here. Beyer, Here. Boquist, Here. Burdick, Here. Close, Here. Devlin, Here. Dingfelder. Edwards, Ferrioli, George, Gerard, Hansel, Haas, Johnson, Knope, Cruz, Monis Anderson, Monroe, Olson, Przonsky, Roblin, Rosenbaum, Shields, Starr, Steiner Hayward, Thompson, Witsit, Winters. President Courtney. Here. The Chief Clerk of the House will call the roll of the House. Bailey. Here. Barker. Here. Barnhart. Here. Barton. Here. Bentz. Here. Berger. Here. Boone. Here. Buckley. Here. Cameron. Here. Clem. Here. Conger. Here. Davis. Here. Dembro. Here. Doherty. Here. Esquivel. Here. Fagan. Here. Frederick. Here. Freeman. Here. Gallegos. Here. Garrett. Gelzer, Gilliam, Gomberg, Gorsick, Greenlick, Hanna, Harker, Hicks, Holvey, Hoyle, Huffman, Jensen, Johnson, Kenimer, Kenny Geyer, Comp, Krieger, Lively, Matthews, McEwen, McLean, Nathanson, Olson, Parrish, Reed, Reardon, Richardson, Smith, Springer, Thatcher, Thompson, Tomei, Unger, Vega Peterson, Widener, Wisnet, Witsit, Williamson, Witt, Here. Speaker Kotek. Here. Madam Speaker, distinguished guests and members of the Joint Assembly, if there is no objection, committees to escort our former governors, state elected officials, judges of the Court of Appeals, and the Tax Court, justices of the Supreme Court, and Governor. Kitzhopper will be named by the chair without the formality of motions. There being no objection, it is now so ordered. Senators Richard Devlin and Senator Bruce Starr and Representative Bruce Hanna and Representative Jules Bailey will serve as a committee to escort the Honorable Victor Atia, former governor of the state of Oregon within the bar of the House. Representatives Sarah Gelser, Representative Julie Parrish and Senators Jeff Cruz and Senators Floyd Brzezanski will serve as a committee to escort the Honorable Barbara Roberts, former governor of this state within the bar of the House. Senators Alan Bates, Senator Larry George, Representative Paul Hovey, and Representative Greg Smith will serve as a committee to escort the state elective officers within the bar of the House. 
Representative Peter Buckley and Representative Andy Olson, Senators Betsy Johnson, Senator Brian Boquist will serve as a committee to escort the Chief Judge and the judges of the, of the Court of Appeals and Tax Court judge within the bar of the House, Senators Rod Monroe, Senator Chuck Thompson, and Representative Jeff Barker, Representative Dennis Richardson, will serve as a committee to escort the Chief Justice and the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court within the bar of the House. Representatives Val Hoyle, Representative Mike McLean, Senators Diane Rosenbaum, and Senator Ted Ferrioli will serve as a committee to escort the Honorable John Albert Kitzhopper, Governor of Oregon within the bar of the House. Please remain seated until the distinguished guests have arrived. Richard. Mm -hmm. Come out there visiting. Let's go. The chair recognizes Senator Richard Devlin. You will escort the honored guest to the section reserved for him.
Chair recognize Senator, excuse me, Representative Sarah Gelser. Thank you, Mr. President. It is my honor to present the Honorable Governor Barbara Roberts. You will escort the honored guest to the section reserved for her. I recognize Senator Alan Bates. Mr. President, I have the honor of presenting the state elective officers, Kate Brown, Secretary of State, Ted Wheeler, State Treasurer, Ellen S. Rosenblum, Attorney General, and Brad Avakian, Commissioner of Labor and Industry. You will escort the elective officers to the section reserved for them. Thank you. <laughs> Don't scare me. <laughs> Chair, recognize Senator, excuse me, Representative Peter Buckley. You will escort the chief judge, associate judges, and the tax court judge to the rostrum. You getting ready? I'm ready to come to you. So I move my spot. Chair recognizes Senator Rod Monroe. Mr. President, I have the high honor to present to you the Honorable Thomas A. Balmer, Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court, and Associate Justices Reeves Kistler, Virginia Linder, Jack Landau, David Brewer, and Richard C. Baldwin. 
You will escort the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices to the rostrum, please. Excuse me, excuse me, let me recognize you first, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I know you're anxious. <laughs> I do have the governor, I am anxious. The chair recognizes Representative Vile Hoyle, please. Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. President, we have the honor of introducing the Honorable John A. Kitzhoffer, Governor of the State of Oregon. You will escort. Governor John Albert Kitzhopper, M.D., to the rostrum. My apologies. Please remain standing. <laughs> the National Salem High School Junior ROTC Honor Guard, Cadet Captain Diana Rios, Commander, Cap Cadet Corporal Maria Troncosco, Cadet Sergeant First Class Sheila Graber, and Cadet Command Sarge Major, Major Bronwyn Ashton will post the colors. The national anthem will be sung by Matthew Moorhead, Staff Sergeant, two-time Iraqi war veteran, serving in the Bravo Battery Field Artillery Unit, and a Master of Music student at Western Oregon University. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, 
say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Please stay standing. The invocation will be given by the Reverend Dr. Leroy Haynes, Jr., pastor for the Allen Temple CME Church in Portland. Almighty and everlasting God, our creator, our sustainer, and our redeemer, Thou who hast brought us thus far by faith, we pray, O Lord, for thy grace and blessing on this august and honorable body of legislators, as well as our beloved governor. We pray, O Lord, for blessings upon the administrative support staff of each legislator and the staff of the governor and other administrators. We pray blessings upon all of the families of each legislator and upon our governor. We pray that the many diverse voices of our state may be heard respected and taken seriously in this legislative process. The voices of the rural and the urban, the entrepreneur and the union, communities of color, male and female, various sexual orientation, the unemployed and the employed, the poor, the hungry, the homeless, the sick, the mentally ill, the victims of mass gun violence and other forms of violence, the educated and the uneducated, the farmer and the environmentalists, the diverse faith communities and the victims of injustice. We pray, O oh Lord, upon this great state of Oregon, we pray that the principles and core values that we share as Oregonians will unite us to forge a common agenda, that we'll address the citizens who are hurting today, and we'll lift the tide of all Oregonians and create a more perfect union. We pray, O oh Lord, that this legislative body we hear the noble call of history, and the historians will pause and write that in spite of one of the most difficult times in our history, in spite of the many differences that the legislators have, that this session will transcend their differences and create a better community for all the citizens of the great state of Oregon. 
We pray this prayer in the name of the all-knowing, all-wise, all-loving God who give us strength, courage, and vision to reach beyond our circumstances and abilities. Amen and amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Reverend Haynes. On behalf of the Joint Assembly, I would like to thank the following uh, groups and individuals who are helping us out today. Classical Alive, as directed by Mary Ann Campbell from the Arts and Communications Magnet Academy for providing the prelude music. The North Salem High School Junior ROTC Honor Guard for posting the colors. Staff Sergeant Matthew Moorhead for singing our national anthem. Reverend Dr. Leroy Haynes, Jr. for the invocation. And I would like to recognize and thank those who are serving as ushers and attendants today, the Oregon National Guard and staff of the Legislative Assembly. Honored guests and dignitaries, please stand as your name is announced. The Chiefs of the Confederated Tribes, Chief Delvis Health, Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs. <laughs> Chairman, Chairman Dan Courtney and Treasurer Robert Van Norman of Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians. <laughs> Chair Reynold Lino and Vice Chairman Jack Giffen of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron. <laughs> Chairman D. Pigsley and Vice Chairman Bud Lane of the Confederated Tribes of Silette's Tribal Government. Former Senate Presidents, the Honorable Bill Bradbury. <laughs> Former Speakers of the House, Phil Lang, Hardy Myers, Karen Minnis, Diane Rosenbaum, Dave Hunt, Bruce Hanna, and Arnie Roblin, if you would all stand to be recognized. Thank you. The first family, First Lady Sylvia Hayes and son Logan Kitzauber. <laughs> Governor Kitzauber's guests, General Fred Reese, Oregon Military Department, Superintendent Rich Evans, Mark Wallace State Fire Marshal, Craig Roberts, Clackamas County Sheriff, and Ken Johnson, City of Fairview Police Chief, President of Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police. Please stand and be recognized. Thank you. <laughs> and at the rear of the chamber at my desk, three former electeds who were trailblazers for the LGBT community, Gail Shibley, George Amy, and Chuck Carpenter, who served in this body. And now Classical Alive, directed by Mary Ann Campbell from the Arts and Communications Magnet Academy, Beaverton School District, will perform pastoral from Concerto Grosso, <laughs> Opus 6, number 8 in G minor.
Thank you, that was wonderful. Now I would like to introduce the Honorable Peter Courtney, President of the Senate, who will address the Joint Assembly. Thank you, uh, Speaker Kotek, uh, Governor Kitzhopper, members of the judiciary, uh, members of the executive branch, both those that are appointed and elected, family, friends, acquaintances, fellow Oregonians, members of the media, as well as those whose job it is today to provide security for us that are all around, uh, trying to make sure that we have a safe and a peaceful time in this remarkable event. And to the members of the Oregon House of Representatives, where I started back so long ago, the Oregon State Senate brings to each member of the House a token of our respect, admiration, appreciation, the service that you give to the legislature, to the way we govern, to Oregon, and to Oregon's people. A few months ago, I was alone on the Senate floor, and I was gazing at the little tiny Oregon flag. I like flags. I'm sentimental. And as I gazed at it, I was stunned. Well, I had planned to take a whole bunch of those little flags and distribute them to a Butte High School that asked me to come speak. My son works in Butte, Montana, and he asked me to be there. Well, you see, if you look at the Oregon flag, there is no other state flag in the nation that is two-sided. I'm fond of saying Oregon likes to be first or only. Well, in this case, she's only. Every other state that had a two-sided flag has dropped away from it. Massachusetts years ago, and before that, Alabama, I believe, were the only, the last two. I am not a vexillologist. My staff really sweated me saying that. <laughs> That's a person who studies flags. I love to say these things. We believe that only one country in the world has a two-sided flag, and that is the country of Paraguay. And so on your desk, I decided to go out and find a company to make two-sided flags. There are no companies that make two-sided flags that small. <laughs> Just go and look. Not that small. On the one side of your great Oregon flag is our great seal, and the other side is the mighty beaver. That is the Oregon flag. No other flag does that. Well, wouldn't you know? Secretary of the Senate started to work, and we went to the Corrections Department, which had put together all the furniture and the remodel, and also has Prison Blues and Pendleton. And they, in Pendleton, hand wove every single one of these little flags that's on your desk today. But there's a problem. When our Secretary of the Senate rushed in, to show me the flag and stuck it in the little platform, it tipped over. It's a little heavier than the other flag. <laughs> so we went out to the Oregon State Penitentiary, the carpentry department, the very department that made all the white oak desks in this house and the black walnut desk in the Senate. And they made 60 little platforms of white oak for your little flag, the American and the Oregon, and they made 30. 30 black oak little platforms for the little flags that now are on the House of the Senate floor. I paid for these out of my own funds. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't tell you that to get applause. I just tell you that to make sure that none of you that really would like not to see me here don't get any ideas. And so, the Senate brings you these flags. Our flag is very special. It forced me to look it up. 
It's first placed in statute in 1925. The first flag was hand sewn by Blanche Cox and Marjorie Kennedy. Now, the flag that they sewed while it was here in Salem now flies in the Eastern Oregon University in La Grande, just down the road from where our new two-sided flags were made. My remarks are very simple now. I think it is remarkable that Oregon has a two-sided flag. Two sides, two talented women, Oregon's own Betsy Rosses sewed this original flag. Two sides, two chambers of the Oregon legislature. Two sides, two parties represented here in this legislature. Two sides, at least two points of view on every issue. In the coming weeks, we will consider legislation originating in the Senate and legislation originating here in this distinguished chamber. But neither House bills nor Senate bills can become law if they are adopted by just one chamber. Our committee-driven process here is designed to hear all sides of an argument on the issues we discuss. And to be honest, to truly represent the people of Oregon, we need the participation from both members and members of both parties. It's a tough process. The legislative process, to be frank with you, is brutal. It's going to be a tough month, five month session. If we only consider one side of any issue, that will only make it tougher. This session, this session, let the two-sided Oregon flag on our desk be a reminder to listen to all sides of each issue, to engage members of both parties, and that it takes both chambers to make legislation process complete and work. Good luck. We in the Senate hope you like your first of a kind, authentic, little historic Oregon flag. She's small, but she's significant. Thank you very much. And now it's my high honor and privilege to introduce the Honorable Speaker, Christine Louise Tina Kotek, who will now address the Joint Assembly. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the House, we graciously accept your very generous gift to us, and we will keep them front and center on our desks. Thank you so very much. And thank you all for being here. Those who are watching us streaming, those of you who are here in the audience, we really appreciate you being here today. Oregon State Song, Oregon My Oregon, which we will all try to sing here in a little bit, describes Oregon as a land of promise. 25 years ago, I was looking for that same sense of promise, that hope for new opportunities when I put all my stuff on an Amtrak train and traveled three and a half days from the East Coast to Eugene in the middle of a very rainy November. But despite the weather, I was excited about the possibilities. And that first year, I, it was a memorable one because I had the opportunity to explore the state. I still vividly remember my first visit to the Oregon coast, that breathtaking part of our state, to beautiful yachts and watching the sea lions on Strawberry Hill. And so let me tell you, as a kid who grew up on the East Coast and spent the summers at the Jersey Shore. We don't have sea lions on the Jersey Shore, so it was very cool. And that first year, I also drove from Eugene to Ontario and was blown away by the vastness and magnificence of the mountains and high desert, and by the fact that we were still in Oregon in a different time zone when we got to Ontario. That doesn't happen on the East Coast. I fell in love with Oregon, all of Oregon, 25 years ago. And it's a tremendous honor to serve our great state as Speaker of the House. And I promise to lead the House on behalf of the entire state. Each House and Senate member represents a unique part of our state and has an obligation to represent the families that elected them. I also firmly believe that we are charged with a broader moral responsibility to the people of this great state as a whole, to their health, their safety, 
their economic security. And I believe we hold an equally important moral obligation to the health, safety, and security of our children and our grandchildren. Balancing our commitment to our constituents, our commitment to our state, and our commitment to future generations won't always be easy. But doing so is, in my view, how we keep faith with our values and also keep faith with those who elected us. And keeping that faith, respecting that trust, has never been more important. It's a critical time in our, for our state's democratic institutions, for a state that is just shy of 154 years old. Because the people's faith in elected leaders is strained right now, and faith in government even more so. We must take action that continues to prove to Oregonians that, unlike Congress, we do things differently here. We can get things done. We believe in cooperation and collaboration. We are ready to take on difficult challenges. Because when it comes down to it, there are certain basics that matter deeply to all Oregonians. Whether you're a berry farmer in the Willamette Valley or a kindergarten teacher in the Illinois Valley, an accountant in Southern Oregon or a fisherman on the North Coast, a nurse in Eastern Oregon or a plumber from Gresham, it shouldn't matter if your ancestors were here before the first white settlers, if you're a born and bred duck or beaver, or you're the grateful son or daughter of an immigrant. No matter who you go home to at night or what your job is as you head off in the morning, we share common hopes and dreams. We want a good education for our children, a chance to afford college, the opportunity for a good job and decent wages, a fair shot at keeping a roof over our heads, and some sense of security in our retirement. These priorities, Oregon, will be our priorities. To the small business owners, the stressed out parents, the laid off workers, the dedicated teachers, the students struggling to afford college, and the families fighting to keep their homes. I want you to know that we are listening. We're here to do the people's business. We're here to listen to the voices of all Oregonians. And we welcome an active and engaged citizenry to help us move Oregon forward. Dorothy Day, the strong-willed Catholic social justice activist from the last century, said her experiences taught her to, quote, disregard people's talk and judge only their actions, unquote. When we adjourn the 77th, 77th legislature in June, you will have an opportunity to judge the fruits of our labor. I hope Oregon will be proud. And every person in this building and across the state, whether they realize it or not, is counting on that to be true. And so I'm honored to work with each and every one of you to deliver on the priorities of the one Oregon we all serve. Thank you very much. And now the Salem Trumpet Ensemble, directed by Jamie Hall, will perform the Canterbury Flourish. Thank you so much. And now, it's my honor to present the Honorable John A. Kitzhaber, Governor of the State of Oregon, to deliver his State of the State Address. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Kotek, President Courtney, and to all the members of the Oregon Legislature, thank you for having me here this morning. I'd like to uh, once again um, thank Sylvia and my son Logan for joining me today, and uh, my friends uh, and next-door neighbors, Jerry and Celia Murphy, and their son Coleman. Uh, I would also like to say a few words about uh, someone who was previously recognized, uh, and that is uh, a man who has a record of distinguished service for the state uh, for over five decades, uh, Major General uh, Fred uh, F. Reese. Um, he is now, in July, will be completing his third term as Adjutant General for the state of Oregon. Uh, General Reese has served with honor and with distinction as the commander of our National Guard, as the head of our emergency management response, and serving as my Homeland uh, Security Advisor. General, on behalf of all Oregonians, we want to thank you for your great service to this state and to the United States of America. I also want to just uh, also congratulate um, uh, Jim Willis, uh, who is, will be retiring after almost a decade as the head of the Oregon Department of Veteran Affairs. Uh, and to all our veterans, to those men and women everywhere who wear the uniform, uh, our thanks, and especially to those who continue to serve overseas, our thoughts and our prayers. I also want to recognize today some of Oregon's finest first responders who were also my guests this morning. Like all Oregonians, I was shocked and saddened by the tragic Clackamas Town Center shootings in December. And what we have learned from the horrifying details is that it had not been for the courage and the immediate work of our first responders, the situation could have been much, much worse. And I just want to take this opportunity once again to recognize Clackamas County Sheriff Craig Roberts, Oregon State Police Superintendent Rich Evans, State Fire Marshal Mark Wallace, Fairview Police Department Chief Ken Johnson, who is the president of the Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police. There are not the words to express uh, my sorrow for the families who lost loved ones, to the friends and to the larger community who was impacted by this tragedy. So I'd ask you to join me in a moment of silence for the victims of gun violence everywhere and a prayer that somehow together we can lift this stain from our land. Thank you. Today, as we welcome Oregon's 77th Legislative Assembly, I am reminded of the rich history of this institution, a history that winds all the way back to Shampooey in 1841 and the first discussions about developing a provisional government. And in retelling the story, our tendency has been to highlight certain events and dates, and in doing so, creating a narrative, however incomplete, for Oregonians as Oregonians. From statehood in 1859 to the Progressive Era, to the establishment of the referendum and initiative system at the turn of the 20th century, to some of our more recent legislative history, like the oft-told story of land use planning and of the Bottle Bill. These have been touchstones, I think, over the years that have helped define this state and also our image of ourselves. Much has been said and written about this state's historic record of landmark legislation, but I think too little about the legislators behind it. Because the real history of this body, the real strength of this institution, is that for over 150 years, this has been a place of citizen legislators. This is a people's institution. In a very real sense, it has well represented the hopes, the dreams, the priorities, and in fact, sometimes even the prejudices of Oregonians. The very first legislative assembly, as you know, was a group of ranchers and shop owners and farmers. In fact, so many farmers that the very timing of our legislative session is influenced by harvest schedules. These early citizen legislators did not check their day jobs at the door, and it has been the same every, every year since. Betty Roberts was one such pioneer. Relying on her own experience to guide her, she worked as a member of the House and the Senate to advance and champion equal rights for women. 
As the Oregonian's Susan Nielsen wrote in tribute after her death, her advocacy for women's issues began immediately and she tackled everything, large and small. The ability to keep one's name, the ability to make financial decisions without a man's permission, the ability to escape from an abusive marriage, and yes, the right to reproductive choice. Another champion was Representative Paul Hanneman, who served 13 consecutive terms, 26 years in the House of Representatives. And it is not possible, I think, to fully understand Oregon's bottle bill and the motivation behind it without understanding the story of Paul Hanneman and his constituent Richard Chambers, who was the father of Representative Vicki Vicki Berger, and the four years they spent tenaciously fighting to get the bottle bill passed. Hanneman, as you might remember, was a dory fisherman, and he brought Tillamook County with him when he came to this chamber, and Oregon is better for it. Hector McPherson is no different. The first of three generations of McPhersons to serve in this body, Hector's farm near Albany was never far from his mind as he helped shape Oregon's landmark land use laws. So the giants of this institution, the heroes have been those members who have caucused as Democrats and Republicans, but have legislated as Oregonians. Astoria and Pendleton, Ashland and Portland were in their bones, but Oregon was in their hearts. The 77th Legislative Assembly has exactly that same potential. You are farmers and ranchers and small business owners, educators, caregivers, doctors, dentists, and librarians. You're retirees from law enforcement and firefighting in the military. And it is your unique experience and your wisdom that is going to allow us to meet the challenges that affect this state at this particular moment in our history. Our state of the state is strong today, in large part because of the courage and the commitment of its citizen legislators. You defy, I think, the cynicism all too common today about a government that's somehow divided from its people. And more than at any other time in Oregon's history, this legislative assembly lives up to the ideal of being representative of all Oregonians. That's not a guarantee of perfection. It's certainly not a guarantee of agreement, but it does ensure that our debate will be more inclusive of the diverse voices and needs of communities throughout this state. And I think we should never underestimate the significance of a body that continues to look more and more like the state and the people that it represents. When I was president of the Senate, I used to draw inspiration from John Kennedy, who wrote once that where nature makes natural allies of us all, we can demonstrate that beneficial relations are possible even with those with whom we most deeply disagree. Over the past two years, this body has demonstrated that it is not only possible to disagree agreeably, but to move beyond what divides us and build instead on what unites us. A shared vision of a strong middle class, equal opportunity for every Oregon and every community in our state, good schools, good jobs, and a government that's fiscally responsible and efficient. With this common vision, we have made great strides for the benefit of Oregonians over the past two years. Just two years ago, we faced a $3.5 billion budget deficit, double-digit unemployment, and an uncertain future. And here in Salem, we faced a divided legislature, making many people say that progress would be impossible. And then, as it turned out, the legislature wasn't so divided after all. Set an example for the nation, members of both parties and both chambers came together and did not shy away from making the difficult decisions to put Oregon's economy on an upward trajectory. We erased one of the largest per capita deficits in the nation with civility, not rancor, with bipartisanship, not gridlock. And we did it with a budget that was based on priorities, not just on programs. Reforms in education and health care and key investments in innovation embody the changes necessary to accelerate Oregon's economic recovery and restore our shared prosperity. Today, compared with where we were two years ago, our state is clearly on the right track. We've gone from a $3.5 billion budget deficit in 2011 to a balanced budget today. We've improved our credit rating from AA to AA+. We've cut our unemployment rate by over 2%. We've created nearly 40,000 jobs while being home to the second fastest growing economy in the nation. We've come a long way since January of 2011, and we should celebrate our progress because we did it together and because it didn't come easily. But at the same time, we need to recognize that in spite of the progress we've made, there are far too many Oregonians who are still being left behind. So our great challenge is to ensure that the next phase of Oregon's economic recovery, Oregon's economic reinvention, 
reaches all Oregonians and ends the income stagnation that continues to erode incomes and wages, that exacerbates inequality, and for the first time threatens a generation of Oregonians with the prospect of a falling standard of living. We cannot and we will not settle for an unequal, uneven, or hesitant recovery. In fact, I think recovery is the wrong word if it's used to describe a state where employment in the Portland metro area returns to pre-recession levels, while much of rural Oregon continues to suffer the economic and social consequences of double-digit unemployment, outdated infrastructure, and an aging workforce. The word recovery is warped if we use it at a time when unemployment rates for white Oregonians are falling, but for African Americans, Native American, and Latino Oregonians, unemployment is rising. And the word recovery is not the word to use for a state that still has a 24% childhood poverty rate. Clearly, we have a lot yet to do, because Oregon will not be a good place for any of us to live until it's a good place for all of us to live. Now, there may be no quick fix, but you can be sure that there can only be a fix with an intentional strategy that is not limited to just putting Oregonians back to work. It must also include an effort to raise per capita income back up above the national average and to reduce poverty. This is a legislative session that has the opportunity to ask and answer the questions about what it will take to make that happen. How can we ensure that more of the jobs we're creating in this state are actually family wage jobs? How can we get more of those jobs out into rural Oregon? What will it take to put people in poverty on a path to prosperity and to family wage jobs? How can we help eliminate the barriers to growth and success of our homegrown small businesses? And how can we better align our fragmented workforce training programs to better deliver results for more Oregonians and better serve the needs for growing businesses and underserved populations alike? The Oregon Business Plan that has guided our efforts over the past two years is built on three pillars. First, to create 25,000 jobs a year between now and 2020, to raise per capita income back up above the national average by 2020, and to reduce poverty back down to 10% by 2020. These three pillars recognize, on the one hand, that private sector job creation is the foundation for an enduring prosperity, but they also recognize that that prosperity must lift up everyone in every corner of this state and in every community, and that if we don't reduce poverty, not every Oregonian will have their shot at the American dream. And that means that over the next two years, our commitment to these second two pillars must be just as strong as our commitment to the first. Far too many Oregonians continue to struggle with unemployment, with debt, with rising health care costs. And that's the urgency that you bring with you to this 77th Legislative Assembly. And it's that sense of urgency that is at the core of the budget that I presented to you last month, a budget that is based and guided by the three principles that I think have guided us over the last two years, putting children and families and education first, investing in jobs and innovation, and reducing the cost of government. It's also a budget that is built on the assumption that we can't wait for economic recovery to begin to invest in children and family and education. When I first came to the Oregon House of Representatives in 1979, kids could drop out of Roseburg High School in the 10th and 11th grade and get good jobs in the mill or the woods with good wages and good benefits. Those days are long gone. And over the past few years, the economic benefits of education have continued to grow. In 1979, the average college graduate earned 38% more than the average high school graduate. Today, the average college graduate earns 75% more. And over 60% of the jobs we'll create over the next decade will require at least a technical certificate or an associate's degree. Yet only 67% of our students are graduating from high school, taking many of them off the path to economic security. And if, as I believe, it is the promise of opportunity that lies at the heart of the American dream, the promise of upward mobility, the promise that if you work hard, you can build a better life for yourselves and your kids, and that each generation should be better off than the last. Then clearly, public education is the vehicle through which that promise is most directly fulfilled today. And although we've made huge progress in developing a seamless and integrated system of education from early childhood to college and career, we have not yet had the resources to seriously invest in our 40-40-20 goals. And it's clear to me that the entire enterprise of public education is underfunded at all levels. And it's equally clear that we can't achieve our 40-40-20 objectives without a significant reinvestment of resources in the classroom. To make that happen, a number of things are necessary. 
In the long term, we need comprehensive reform of Oregon's public finance system. That's going to take time, it's going to take discipline, and it's going to take a very strategic approach. And over the last eight months, we began to rebuild the coalitions and put in place the infrastructure to move forward on that important task. But we can't wait for comprehensive revenue reform to begin to reinvest in the classroom if we hope to actually achieve the ambitious economic and educational objectives we've set for our state. It's not going to be an easy task, but I believe it is a very urgent task. We may have erased our budget deficit, but we continue to face very serious fiscal constraints, which means that we need to make room in the current budget if we hope to begin to reinvest in the classroom and in critical public services. I am prepared to stand with you to make what will be a series of very difficult decisions to make that happen, including reducing the cost of health care and corrections, reducing the cost drivers that are diverting resources from the classroom, and undertaking a serious review of Oregon's tax expenditures. Let me start with health care, which is perhaps the fastest growing cost for individuals, for families, for businesses, and for state government. Our new health care model, our new care model that we're delivering under the coordinated care organizations is projected to hold medical inflation in the Medicaid program constant at 3.4% starting the second year of this biennium. That will save $100 million in general fund this biennium, almost $200 million in the next biennium, and $400 million in the 2017-2019 biennium. In other words, the delta that's created by holding medical inflation constant creates a huge and growing opportunity for reinvestment as we go forward. Therefore, our long-term ability to seriously reinvest in public education depends to some extent on our ability to successfully prove up this care model in the upcoming biennium and extend it to the private market. If, for example, we were to make available to school teachers and public employees the same kind of high-quality, low-cost delivery model that we're developing under the CCOs, the projected 10-year savings is $5 billion. This could be a total game changer for state finance and could create an enormous competitive advantage for Oregon businesses, both large and small. Corrections is a second area where cost reductions are both needed and possible. Along with health care, the relentless growth in the Department of Corrections is one of the main reasons we can't reinvest in children and families and education or in community corrections or other proven uh, crime prevention measures at the local level. It costs $10,000 a year to keep a child in school. It costs $30,000 a year to keep someone in prison. Now, our prison forecast is, projects that we will have to build an additional 2,300 beds at a cost of $600 million over the next 10 years, and that most of those beds will be occupied by nonviolent offenders. The fact is that this $600 million is spent on public safety, local public safety, community corrections, and education could keep hundreds of people out of the criminal justice system in the first place. That's why Oregonians deserve a thoughtful, objective review of the recommendations of the Commission on Public Safety to keep our communities safe while reducing the cost of corrections. The opportunity here is to find alternative and effective ways to sanction nonviolent offenders and to invest in proven crime prevention measures and community corrections instead of building a whole new round of prisons. I recognize, as all of you do, that the politics around any kind of public safety reform are difficult. The fear of being labeled soft on crime in the next election cycle. But I would ask each and every one of you to remember those two numbers, $10,000 a year to keep a child in school and $30,000 a year to keep someone in prison. And to find the courage and honesty to recognize that if we are unwilling to act on this issue in this upcoming legislative session, will by default be choosing prisons over schools and condemning untold numbers of today's students to a future in our system of corrections rather than our system of post-secondary education. We can do better. <laughs> Never before has there been an issue that could benefit more from the thoughtful deliberation of citizen legislators. Now let me turn to the need to reduce cost drivers, which are driving resources out of the classroom. I am well aware that my proposal to cap the cost of living adjustment for PERS retirees is controversial. At the same time, however, if we are serious about reinvesting in the classroom, as well as reinvesting in other important public services, we have to recognize that the crisis in funding in our schools 
And the crisis in funding important services like child protective services and home health workers is no longer just a revenue problem. It has also become a cost problem. In this upcoming biennium, for example, the cost of primary and secondary education will increase over $1,000 per pupil. And half of that, $500 per pupil, is accounted for by the increase in PERS alone. The rest is accounted for by salary and other benefits. In other words, we're faced with a situation where we're going to increase our expenditures in primary and secondary education by $1,000 per pupil. And for that significant investment of resources, we will not see a reduction in average class size. We will not see the restoration of lost school days. And we will not see the restoration of, of, of uh, classes like art and vocational services. Now, I want to be very, very clear. This is not about the value of our teachers or our public employees. This is not about a major overhaul of a retirement system that remains one of the best funded in the nation. It is simply about the necessity of having a conversation about how to strike a balance between the cost of our retirement system and our ability to put dollars in the classroom today to make sure that our children are successful tomorrow. Like public safety, this issue too deserves the careful analysis of a thoughtful citizen legislature. Finally, with regard to tax expenditures, I'm also prepared to work with you to pursue opportunities for uh, boosting revenue. It's easy, I think, to aggregate the billions of tax dollars that now, now go out in credits and, and deductions uh, and incentives. It's much more difficult to actually find a way to realize cost savings. But I think that a compelling case can be made in 2013 to reconsider and reassess the policies and decisions we made in the past around these tax expenditures in light of the realities of today and the necessity of reinvesting in critical public services and in public education. I would include the senior medical deduction, the level of state deductibility of federal Schedule A income, and the possibility of capping total deductions and credits as areas worth further discussion. And again, this is an area that can benefit from the thoughtful deliberation of citizen legislators. It's going to take all of us together to create jobs today while positioning Oregon to be more competitive in the global economy of tomorrow. It's going to take all of us working together to drive our state's per capita income back up above the national average. And it will take all of us working together to erase the troubling income disparities that have existed for too long within our communities of color, within English language learners, and between urban and rural communities. Which brings me back to where we began. The very simple premise that everyone in this state deserves a shot at that vision of Oregon that I believe all of us share. A state committed to equity and opportunity for all, a state committed to secure jobs and upper mobility, and to safe, secure communities where people have a sense of common purpose and commitment to one another. The same sense of common purpose and commitment that we find here in this building and in this chamber today. That should give us hope. In the words of Wallace Stegner, one cannot be pessimistic about the West. This is still the native home of hope. When it fully learns that cooperation, not rugged individualism, is the quality that most characterizes and preserves it, then it will have achieved itself and outlived its origins. Then it has a chance to build a society to match its scenery. Here in Oregon, our legislator, our 77th Legislative Assembly, the men and women who are gathered in this chamber today, I think are living proof that cooperation is the quality that most characterizes. And that through cooperation, and through trusting and relying on one another, and through hope, I believe that we can build a society to match our scenery. It's easy, I think, sometimes for hope to fade when we think about the enormous list of things that we still have to do. So for all of you in this grand room today, and to everyone throughout this wonderful state, I want to leave you with this, with the, this story. To me, it offers a perspective on how far we've come, but also on how far we have yet to go. When I was in Coos Bay uh, last November at the annual Government to Government Summit between the state of Oregon and our nine federally recognized tribes, uh, Diane Tiemann from the Burns Paiute tribe rose to speak. Now, the Burns Paiute is a relatively poor tribe in some ways. They don't have the wealth of the Grand Ronde, for example. They don't have the land base of the Warm Springs. But they have something else. And Diane told a story of her grandmother after the Bannock War of 1878. When as a preteen, she was marched all the way to Boise, 
and then another 300 miles to a reservation in Yakima, from which she escaped with another young woman. And together they swam the Columbia River and traveled over 300 miles back to Burns. And it was there with no land and no resources that they began to rebuild their tribe. And Diane said that when she looks out and sees other tribes that are better off than the Burns Piute, she's not envious. She remembers her grandmother and she thinks, look how far we've come. There's a lesson here for us, I think, and for our state. It was a really long, hard path from January 2011 to here, and a long, difficult road stretches out before us. So when we leave this place this morning, let's commit ourselves to partnership and to a shared vision so that when we reassemble here two years from now in this chamber, we can once again say, look how far we've come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. We all have a lot of work to do, and we very much appreciate your words. I would now ask everyone to please turn your attention one more time to the South Balcony as the Monmouth singers, Sherry Alvis, Matthew Moorhead, Dr. Kevin Helpy, and Dr. Keller Coker from the Music Department at Western Oregon University perform Oh, When the Saints. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, how I'd love. Saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints go marching in, go marching in. When the saints go marching in, oh, how I love. Thank you. So now it's our turn. Um, the words to our state song are in the program. I would ask that everyone please stand as we honor our state by singing our state song, Oregon, My Oregon. 
We're going to get a little help and be led by Dr. Kevin Helpy, professor of vocal music from Western Oregon University. Dr. Helpy. Land of the Empire Builders, land of the Golden West. Conquered and held by freemen, famine and the best. Onward and upward ever, forward and on and on. Hail to the land of heroes, my Oregon. Land of the rose and sunshine, land of the summer's breeze. Laden with health and vigor, fresh from the western seas. Blessed by the blood of martyrs, land of the setting sun. Hail to the land of promise, my Oregon. You may be seated and uh, well done, everyone, well done. <laughs> so I would ask everyone to please remain until our distinguished guests have departed the House chamber. Representatives Hoyle, McLean, and Senators Rosenbaum and Ferrioli will escort Governor Kitzhaber from the House. Please rise. Senators Monroe and Thompson and Representatives Barker and Richardson will escort the Chief Justice and Associate Justices of the Supreme Court from the House. Representatives Buckley and Olson and Senators Johnson and Boquist will escort the Chief Judge and Associate Judges of the Court of Appeals and the Tax Court Judge from the House. Senators Bates and George and Representatives Holvey and Smith will escort the state elective officers from the House. <laughs> Representatives Gelser and Parrish and Senators Cruz and Brzezanski will escort Governor Roberts from the House chamber. Senators Devlin and Starr and Representatives Hannah and Bailey will escort Governor Atia from the House Chamber. Please be seated. I now declare the joint assembly adjourned. Members of the House and guests will remain seated while the House Sergeant in Arms escorts the President and members of the Senate from the House chamber.
Announcements. Representative Tomei, I need a recess motion for 2.30 p.m. today, January 14th, 2013. You shall have it. <laughs> I move that the House stand in recess until 2.30 this afternoon without object. Oh, no, that's your speech. I move that the House stand in recess until 2.30 p.m. Thank I you, Representative. My position. Representative Tomei moves the House stand in recess until 2.30 p.m. without objection. The House will stand in recess until 2.30 p.m. Thank you.